Welcome to the WCVS Business Breakfast presented by Dime Community Bank. We're so happy to have you all here. I'm Neil A. Caruso, the business producer here at WCBS 880, also the founder and owner of Caruso Enterprises, which is producing this program today, and our small business spotlight series, which you can watch every week. We publish a new episode every Monday at WCBS880.com, telling stories of businesses in our community, also proudly sponsored by Dime. And I will be pinch hitting for Joe Connolly today. Unfortunately, he is under the weather. So, Joe, we wish you good speed and uh, get better soon. We'll see you soon, buddy. So today is our first in-person business breakfast since COVID. Really good to have some people in the audience today. We've done these virtually for the last three years, which has been fun. Uh, we've had the likes of Mark Cuban on and Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank, Andrew Newey, the uh, former chairman of Pepsi. Uh, but it's really nice to have today's panel because we're going to talk about the return to the office, which seems like it's a topic we talk about every fall, but all the more important now is we talk about New York City's recovery and the overall economy. So that'll be the topic of conversation for today. Who better to talk about it than the new chief executive officer of Dime Community Bank, Stuart LeBeau. Stu? Thank you, very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, I'm Stu Lubo, president and CEO of Dime, and we're thrilled to be here uh, and able to sponsor uh, CBS Business Breakfast. Uh, you know, Dime has uh, been around for a little bit, been uh, established in 1864. I haven't been there the whole time. <laughs> Sometimes I feel that way. But uh, one thing about Dime is we've always been part of the community, servicing the businesses and local uh, individuals, consumers within our communities. Uh, this year has been a challenging year. And uh, since uh, what I deem March Madness, when when uh, the, the, uh, the world seemed to be very challenging for banks. Uh, Dime's one of the few banks that's grown its deposits, grown its loans, and continues to support the community. Um, on top of that, we've really focused on adding technology and building our technology stack so that we can better service small business uh, and, and our consumers. Our SBA and small business lending is uh, is one of the leaders in the metropolitan area, and we're thrilled that we're able to continue to to lend and support our our, our businesses within the communities we serve. So, with that, you know, let's. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing our esteemed guest and uh, hearing the panel discussions. So, thank you. Stu, if I have you for a moment, let me ask you a question. Because I'm curious, what is the biggest concern business owners have right now? They're coming to you, approaching you for capital. What is the what is the biggest thing you're hearing? Well, it, it really depends on the on the industry. I mean, one of the big issues on Long Island East End is finding people to work, uh, particularly in the hospitality business. So that's been one of their drawbacks. If you if you look at some of the restaurants and 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 hotels and whatnot, they've reduced hours and, and reduced their operating hours basically because they didn't, haven't had enough personnel to staff. Uh, you know, they're, you know, they're very successful businesses. Uh, back here in New York, <coughs> you're starting to see in Manhattan, you're starting to see everyone come back to work. We're going to be talking about that. But again, you know, it's, it's not a hundred percent, and if you look from Tuesday to Thursday, we're probably at ninety percent right now. But then Mondays and Fridays, you know, it's more like seventy percent, sixty-five percent. So what does that mean? It means all the local small businesses that are supported by the folks that commute every day, that work every day in the offices in in New York City, are affected by that. So you know. As we get back out of the hybrid environment and, and more toward back to work, and we're going to talk about that, I think that's going to help you know, the, uh, the economy and the small businesses locally. And of course, interest rates uh, are, are more difficult today than they have been with the Fed raising rates over 500 basis points in the last 18 months. Unprecedented, but you know, it's something that we all have to deal with. Stu, thanks. Thanks for your analysis. Thanks for your input. I appreciate your partnership here. Dive Community Bank has been a sponsor at WCBS 880 and our sister station, 1010 Wins, for I think it's more than six years. Mark can tell me it's, if uh, the exact number, but six years of sponsoring small business uh, spotlight or small business programming at WCBS 880 for sure. Uh, so thank you to you guys and all you do uh, at Dime. 
Thank you, Community Bank. They got your bank. Because growing a business keeps you on the go, we've got your bank. Because a steady cash flow is the lifeblood of your bottom line, we've got your bank. Because your workday simply doesn't stop at 5 o'clock, we've got your bank. Dime Community Bank gives you the digital tools you need to simplify your business banking, even deposit checks, anytime from anywhere. And we back our technology with a team that's always there, wherever business takes you. Visit Dime.com to learn more. All right, let me welcome up Rob Walsh, who's going to be my co-host today. You know him from our sister station, 1010 Wins. The bottom line, a small business on 1010. And bring up our panel as well. We'll introduce you guys. Grab your seat. So I'll introduce everyone. Rob Walsh, as I mentioned. We'll go left to right. We've got Jeff Rose of Attitude New York, chauffeur transportation service here in the city. Does the likes of Saturday Night Live and all the late night shows as well. It's Always exciting to talk about. Welcome back with the strike, by the way. <laughs> now, Rob is a former New York City Small Business Commissioner, and his successor here, Kevin Kim, the current New York City Small Business Services Commissioner. Kevin, welcome. <laughs> Bruce Mosler, Chairman of Global Brokerage at Cushman and Wakefield. Bruce, thank you for coming in this morning. <laughs> so, Rob, I'd like to start where we kind of left off in that discussion with Stu. Um, you know, the return to the office here, it does some days feel like the traffic is uh, absurd, and then some days are easier to come in. This morning was easy for me to come in, um, but it was also 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Jeff, let me start with you on kind of the, you know, uh, transportation right now and the commuting um, that you see. What's uh, what are you seeing? Is it Tuesday, Thursday is the busiest day? Monday, Wednesday, Friday is lighter. What's what are the patterns? Uh, well, it's okay. It's interesting, uh, as you said, Mondays uh, and Fridays. What we're finding is, for instance, where Friday used to be the big uh, getaway rush hour at the end of the day. Now it's Thursday. Thursday is the most difficult day to get home. And we're also seeing an uptick in uh, usage on the MTA subways and buses and so on. I think they last week announced that they had the highest ridership mm -hmm. since uh, COVID started. It's hard. People are still trying to find their ways. And eventually, people's patterns will follow the needs of their employers and the employers' needs in servicing their customers. I think also a lot of young folks today don't understand the value. Uh, you know, we're here sponsored by a community bank. Thank you very much. My first passbook when I was a kid was at the Dime Savings Bank. So is mine. Yeah. But we're finding that, you know, community is not just where you live. Community is in the office. Community is your peers at other companies as well. And I think that folks are going to start to realize that they're missing out on something if they're not in a in a situation where they can bounce ideas off other people, ask for help more easily. And I think at some point you'll start to see some isolation where people are not as comfortable as well. So I think it's going to be a gradual evolution or a return to what it was, uh, but it's going to be slow and it's going to take some time and it's also important for the MTA to improve its uh, service. I, I never thought I'd be happy to see a crowded subway car. <laughs> like. I don't know about you, it's like, oh yeah, the people are coming back now, that's great. What do the numbers look like? What do the numbers look like in terms of vacancies in our central business district? And um, what are the challenges to fill that office space again, Bruce? The, the easy question. Um, so let's just begin with the staff. Um, first and foremost, we are gonna be living in a high workplace for a little bit. In the beginning, you were hearing people talk about how remote was going to be the thing of the future, Zoom was going to replace in person. We now know that's not. Um, people are coming back at least three, sometimes four days a week. That's what business is requesting. That's what we're seeing in terms of the numbers. We're now over 50%. Want to make this point the benchmark was never 100%. Buildings were never 100% occupied. Best case, it was 70 to 75% based on people's travel, based on sickness, based on based on working from clients' offices. So that's the benchmark, let's keep it in mind. Secondly, 
we know now that young people want to come in to be mentored. Mentorship is the only way that you grow exponentially. Incremental growth can happen, maybe through remote. I'm not even sure that's true. But the truth is, young people want to be mentored. They want to learn, and they want to learn quickly. And so to innovate and to collaborate, you have to do that in person. We're seeing that. Uh, the New York City Partnership recently put out a report that said office occupancy was just over 58%. Our numbers say it's just a little bit lower, but it is coming back steadily. Let's address the elephant in the room, the economy. At the end of the day, let's be clear. This is not like 0809. I managed a firm through 0809. That was a financial crisis. That was over leveraging in the financial sector. It corrected relatively quickly. This is more than that. This is the hybrid workplace. This is also the fact that we are seeing businesses on pause because of interest rate volatility. When we see interest rates stabilize, I think we'll see a significant movement in business. We had this pause post-COVID, by the way. And then in 22, we saw take-up that was on the 10-year average, all the, all the way back to 24, 25 million feet. I can't tell you that that will happen when next year or in Q1 of 25, but we are seeing pent-up demand. There's been a bifurcation of the market. To your question, what's happening? Not all offices performing, but the high-end new development Offices, office buildings that are being invested in, meaning they're amenitized, meaning that they're changing their filtration systems out, that they're doing what has to be done to attract this workforce, those buildings are outperforming. So we are seeing um, movement. We are seeing, in fact, uh, positive absorption in places like Park Avenue. Assets that sit on top of transportation hubs are very attractive to people and to this workforce. New York is going to be just fine. Are there particular areas that you're concerned about? Sure. Look, uh, at the end of the day, we're also dealing with some obsolete property. Let's be candid about this. Buildings that have windows on two sides, assets that sit mid-block and can't really be renovated or invested in. High interest rates made it, made it, make it costly to do so. The idea, the mayor is right, by the way. We need, at the end of the day, affordable housing, desperately. I think the way to do it is through a public-private partnership and a comprehensive study of those buildings that can be converted. Because let's be clear, a commercial asset converted to residential typically loses 25% of the floor plate. So not all assets are meant to be converted. The idea is right. Concept is right. It can be done. It needs to be studied comprehensively. Kevin, um, the office occupancy numbers, like that sexy data point that we've all been pointing to for the last three years. Uh, it seems to have plateaued now, but it is higher, as Bruce mentioned. So how is that impacting retail and restaurants? What are you seeing? Well, first of all, thank you for having us. And it really is nice to do in-person shows again. Um, you know, I, I have to echo a little bit about what Bruce is saying. I mean, when we talk about comeback and we talk about New York City, I think there's no place, and, and you should never, ever, no matter what happens in the city, discount or count out New York City. And this is something that the mayor has been saying is that New York City is not coming back. It is actually back in many ways. And the data backs that up. We've got almost 99.7% job recovery uh, from pre-pandemic. We are uh, at a point where one in every seven businesses that actually exist today. And if you think about small businesses, we're talking about a universe of over 200,000 small businesses. But one in every seven businesses actually got created in the past year when the Adams administration came in and said, we are going to really focus on certain factors that impact vacancy, impact the city's economy, and first and foremost was public safety. This is something that he ran on, and this is something that you're, you're seeing in numbers. All major crime indexes are down, grand larceny is down. In May, we held a retail theft uh, summit Oh, actually, last December, and then we announced the plan on May, where they've really focused in on targeting reduction of retail theft crime. And all of these are important factors to what you're talking about, about how do we get people to understand that with tourism also back, we're, we're almost at 63 million this year, uh, and that's close to pre-pandemic levels again. With all this economic activity happening in the subway and bus riderships up, how can we make sure that people understand that New York City's retail 
industry is going to be able to benefit from all of this. So I think with the storefront vacancy challenges, we are now relying a lot more on technology. We contracted with LiveXYZ, which is a company that has basically mapped out for us the entire city, Manhattan, the other four boroughs. We know exactly where the storefront vacancies are and what businesses surround those vacancies. And we're coming up with a strategy where we're deploying all the trends that are also happening in retail that we see, which is people just coming in and not just taking over one space with one business. We're seeing a lot of shared businesses. If you go into the Oculus, for example, and credit goes to Shashama, the nonprofit that was working on storefront vacancy issues during uh, the pandemic, what they did was, for example, they took a store and they put 10 uh, minority uh, fashion designers, all women actually, all women fashion designers, and they created a space where each of them could display their wares in a particular uh, section. And then you walk in and you turn left and you'll see one design and you turn right and the owners are standing right there. So I think this concept of how do we become a little bit more creative to fill storefront vacancies in the retail spaces in Midtown or in the uh, other boroughs, this is something that uh, we're looking at constantly and we have a lot of ideas to share. So my follow-up there is what's going to accelerate growth? Because traditional retail, we still see a lot of vacancies. Um, downtown, you drive around, there are a lot of um, empty storefronts. So what's going to encourage those people to come back? And then maybe Bruce can piggyback on that in terms of, you know, uh, on a commercial landlord perspective, what's going to, wh what's holding back from um, signing a new tenant? Yeah, I think what's really important was what Bruce also alluded to about public-private partnerships. We realize in this administration, and the mayor has been very vocal about it, that we need private partners. And from government's perspective, from where I sit, what I get to see is pieces of private sector kind of doing what they do best, which is trying to make money, but also trying to solve a problem. And so, for example, um, in terms of accelerating filling the vacancies, I'll be talking to somebody, the Downtown Alliance is, is a bid, uh, an excellent bid that was talking about having a $10,000 incentive to uh, lure people into their stores downtown. At the same time, uh, Ron Molis with the LNM, he's been creating a uh, support for a program called Boss Up NYCHA. And when he said, I'm going to go into NYCHA, find the entrepreneurs, and give out $20,000 to 10 winners, so now you're seeding entrepreneurs who don't necessarily have a retail space, but if you were to match up one of that, those businesses with Downtown Alliance's 10,000 incentive, all of a sudden you're giving somebody $30,000 with a great idea and the spirit to want to be an entrepreneur, uh, a, a place to start their wares. But that's not all. Now you're also looking at companies that have platforms where landlords and tenants can share point of sales information, use a platform where the, uh, the income of a tenant is very clear. And so now you can rely on potentially dynamic leasing structures, right? When a tenant is doing really well, you pay a little bit more. When you're not doing as well that month, you pay a little bit less. And so now we have more technology to leverage that kind of idea. And then on top of that, what I was talking about with shared retail space, we're seeing people out there who are able to take popular online brands. And now once you become a popular online brand, you're like, oh, maybe I should also have a store in Soho or in Midtown or out in the Bronx, commercial quarters where it's thriving. I want eyeballs and people to come in and be able to touch and feel my product. Now you're taking a potentially good location in the Bronx where the business owner is selling, let's say, sneakers, and the sneakers are doing well, but they could help get a little bit of help to offset the rent. So then you get a popular hat brand, and you bring them in, and the hat brand pays sublease money to the tenant, helps offset that. But now you've got a thriving uh, location with a lot more walkthrough traffic of complementary products. People looking for the sneakers are now buying hats and so on. So this is just part of what we're seeing and we're, we're putting this all together as we speak. You know, it, it's interesting to talk about that, right? Right, right here at the studios, right here at um, Hudson Square, how this area has changed dramatically. Fields walk outside, sidewalks are larger, plantings. Um, it seems that this is, and this is for the entire panel, that is the trend New York 
is moving towards, making it a lot more comfortable when you come to work. Whether it's Hudson Square, whether it's Flatiron, whether it's, I, I can't believe we're talking about this, but Fifth Avenue, right? And, and softening the hard edges of our city. Could, could all of the uh, panel speak? Well, it's interesting. A friend of mine uh, runs a company called Corporate Coffee. And one of the things that he is finding is that companies are trying to up the amenities available to their employees to get them to come to work. Uh, there are other issues, and I, I hope I'm not cutting you short here, Neil. Some things it seems like we're doing are, I have to, say, I have to talk about congestion pricing. You know, it seems like if we want more people to come back into the city, and I would imagine you may want to address that uh, in larger part, but it just seems like we're penalizing people for coming into the city. And that seems like something that's going to work against getting more people to come back. And I don't know at what length you want to go into that. Yeah, I mean, you can elaborate on that. I think the congestion pricing story is going to be the biggest one of 2024 for New Yorkers. Um, everyone I talk to, whether they are a business owner or a resident, uh, is very concerned, um, to say the least, um, a lot more expletives to, to add to that, that that people have shared, just in terms of um, the impact it's going to have. How So from your perspective, from a business owner's perspective, what is it going to do to growth? Um, I'm very encouraged that Mayor Adams has chosen a commissioner that comes from a small business background, because oftentimes folks in the government community don't understand the impact that changes in rules and regulations will have on behavior. They look at data and they take a static approach that if we raise this price, for instance, they're going to get the same number of people, so they're going to increase their revenue by this much. And they don't understand that when you change the rules and the parameters, you're also going to change behavior. This is a system that, if it works, will be its own downfall. You know, if the idea is to raise money for the MTA, but you're going to have fewer people coming into the city, so you're going to diminish the revenues that you might generate. And the other problem is that, you know, in the real world, you don't say, well, I need to get better, so I'm going to charge more. You have to get better first. If the city wants people to use more mass transit, I think what they have to do is work on improving mass transit. And if they need to generate more revenue to do that, it should come from uh, more of a general revenue source, whatever that fact might and, be. And, and where do you get a general revenue source? I mean, this is, this is something that we've been dealing with for the longest time. Uh, and, well, when I know, say general revenue, yeah. there could be other fees that are more broadly applied because. So, so you're saying more taxes? No, what I'm saying is that this. Is that? Uh, other than that, I don't know where you'd get it. That's why I'm not so much in favor. You, you, what I'm saying you, is, doing you, you it add this, me to the panel, I start mixing it up. You there you go. Well, <laughs> but but uh, <laughs> doing it this way uh, makes it difficult because a lot of the remedies they're not really remedies. They're just pushing problems into different neighborhoods. Uh, you're going to get much more congestion in areas like Long Island City and Fort Lee and the South Bronx. So what you're, you might even be making Manhattan, one of the criticisms has been is that Manhattan is something becoming a playground for the rich because nobody else can afford it. So all the congestion and all the pollution that congestion pricing is supposed to eradicate or at least diminish, it's not. It's just going to push them into poorer neighborhoods. It's going to have fewer people coming into town, spending less money, I'm not, uh, I mean, we're not talking about proposals. There are, there are proposals that I could suggest in terms of uh, how to do it. But for instance, you mentioned dynamic pricing for rents. You're going to pay the same thing coming into the central business district at noon on a Tuesday as you will at 5 a.m. on a Sunday. So where's the dynamic pricing in that? At least allow people to say, well, we'd rather you not come in during rush hour, but if you come in on Saturday or Sunday, if you come in at night, you will, pay, you will not pay a congestion fee, or you'll pay a lesser congestion fee. This is a one-size-fits-all solution that, that I think may do more harm than good. Just, just a couple comments. I'd like to take a half step back and, and touch on what the commissioner articulated earlier on, uh, because I think retail is a very, very important part of what makes New York City New York City and makes office buildings office buildings. And by that, I mean that retail now has become a critical part of the experience that people expect in office buildings. Office buildings today 
are becoming more and more hospitality centric. It's not just about a building you walk into and go into your office and it's a status situation. Office buildings today have to be a 24 seven live work play environment. And so the retail matters. And the one thing the commissioner touched on that I thought was very much on point is that what we have seen in the transformation of retail in the city is, is we went from Lux brand uh, on every street up and down Madison, Park, Fifth, et cetera, lower Manhattan, to brands now that are really the function of success on online businesses and the need for people to experience them in person. That is really driving retail right now and the return um, of retail, maybe not to the historic highs in rents, but to rents and or, shall we say, participations that are very effective for landlords, but more importantly, making office buildings complete. This is something that I think we cannot lose sight of. And, and it's more than just the office building, Absolutely. isn't it? it it's, it's the neighborhood. It's, it's the public spaces. It's something that Commissioner Kim has been focusing on. Yes. You know, working with the business improvement uh, district, the, the 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 public realm, uh, the, the 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 plazas, the designs, you know, making it cleaner, making it safer. It is. So look at the success of Hudson Yard, and yeah. and what's happened there. It's because the retail has been curated for those areas, not just for the office buildings, but for the communities around them. Communities matter now more than ever. So look at what's going to happen, in my opinion, in the Penn District. When, when we see the completion of the retail plan there, I think it's going to completely and forever change the experience around the Penn District and those, making those areas, A, safer, B, exciting to be in, and C, just as much a part of the city's future as anything else from a standpoint of investment in or reinvestment in infrastructure. I do want to make sure we give the audience a chance to ask any questions that they have. So if you do, you should raise your hand. We'll we'll get around to you. Make sure you uh, use that opportunity. Um, I do want to ask about um, mixed use uh, buildings. That's been something that Rob and I have covered on our respective stations. Um, who wants to take a crack at that one? Because that's been that has been a topic of conversation for three years. Has been the evolution of um, of that work life balance of transforming. Um, these buildings in New York um, into mixed use, erecting new buildings. I think, Bruce, you want to take a crack at that first? No, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Look, I, I again, uh, let's let's be clear. Uh, I'm an office expert. That's what I do. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I have been around this enough to say the following. I think that, like everything else, the you have to look at the neighborhood, the asset itself. Can it be converted physically? What what are the costs to do it in a high interest rate environment? And if all those things add up to, it makes sense for a mixed use, a mixed use asset. Then you have the basis of a conversation. There are buildings that lend themselves to mixed use, whether it happens to be hospitality and office, or more likely these days, residential and hospitality. This is a one. This is a one off. You have to study comprehensively an area and look at the buildings that make the most sense and those landlords that want to do it. So it's not an easy task. It can be done. It should be done. Different than affordable housing where I think in a public-private partnership there is room to run. I think the only thing I'll add to that is that the Department of City Planning under Dan Grodnick, that's what they're looking at. They're looking at all of the zoning and exactly what Bruce said. If it makes sense to do this there, then that's what we want to do. If it makes sense to do this there, then that's what we want to do. You know? And so uh, just having that attitude and having these meetings and interagency meetings where they're getting feedback from small business services or from DOT, you know, transportation, the fact that we're having these conversations is to me uh, one of the most refreshing parts of my job is that we are talking about looking not just what fits now, but what will make sense in the next 5, 10, 15, 25 years. And I'll just add, as mm. someone who's been around a couple of decades, um, this is one of the most pro-business mayors we've had in a very long time, at a moment in time where we really need that support in the system. It is about looking into the future, but it's also what can we do today in the face of changing business dynamics, be it the hybrid workplace or other aspects that we'll have to challenge. 
uh, be challenged by in the future. So let's let's stay on this for a second. Uh, after 9-11, we saw the reimagining, if you will, of lower Manhattan, the old financial district, into a lot of housing. And there were incentives that were developed, and a lot of these aging uh, buildings were converted into housing, very creative housing, and it enlivened the neighborhood. And we've seen the number of residents that are now in lower Manhattan. I have been reading about there's a number of laws on the book, whether it's state or city, that just don't make sense if we're going to try to convert some of this office space into housing. What are they? What needs to be done on that? I'll defer to the oh, commissioner to start. <laughs> well, well, if I can do phone a friend and call the Me Department too. of Buildings <laughs> and <laughs> City Planning. Uh, no, I think the challenges are real. We Safety is the utmost importance and priority of the city. But I think that whatever can be done, I know they're looking at it because I've been in on those conversations listening in. And, um, you know, the, they understand, you know, when the mayor says get stuff done, yeah. get stuff built, well, this is one of his priorities to make sure that whatever the zoning barriers are, or whatever the laws that are in the way that don't make sense, that we remove them. On the small business front, when Mayor Adams came in, day three of his administration, he announced Executive Order 3, where he said, uh, you, SBS Commissioner, and Deputy Mayor Maria Torres Springer, um, why don't you two co-chair this commission where you're going to look at all the regulatory agencies in New York City, health, DP, DOT, everybody. TLC. TLC. We looked at all of those. And we were assigned, we were mandated to pick out the top 25 violations that are given most often to small business owners. And we were to look at each one and examine, does this make sense? Can this be a warning instead of a fine the first time around? Can, this, can there be a cure period as part of this? Or can we just get rid of this completely from the books? And so after about a four-month uh, exercise of this, we were able to find over 110 reforms that will save small business owners over $8 million annually going forward. So just the same exercise that we did with small businesses, that's what they're doing with whatever laws that are standing in the way of progress in terms of uh, filling our offices and making sure that conversion to residential, wherever possible, can be done. So I just want to piggyback on what the commissioner said to answer your question. Um, very specifically, if you want to put your finger on any one thing as it relates to regulation laws, it's zoning conversion and it's those regulations that require certain standards, whether it's carbon neutrality or otherwise, which we need to be moving towards because ESG standards are critical to any tenancy today. But timing is the big issue. If we can push out the timing, give that, give more time, um, a lot of the math makes sense. So there are many other issues, as the commissioner alluded to, but timing is amongst, chief amongst them. Timing is everything, right, Rob? Yeah, no, well, I, I, I just want to congratulate the commissioner. He, he got something done, that, which is absolutely amazing. It's like herding cats and getting all the agencies you know, lined up the way you did. And uh, I think one of the issues that we hear in large government and small government is making it easier to do business in the city. And that's been your signature as, as the small business commissioner. Well, it's really been the mayor and the deputy mayor's signature, and then I just execute well, I'm, I'm, on it. I'm giving you credit. <laughs> well, thank you. And I'm giving credit where credit is due. But honestly, Sometimes I mean... Sometimes you have to take the credit. It's a wise yeah, man. No, thank you. No, really, uh, it's, uh, as, as Jeff said, you know, having been uh, immigrant owner, uh, a business owner myself and then the son of immigrant small business owners and seeing the community, not just of my parents doing what they did, but the community of people that they interacted who were all small business owners. Well, when you see the frustrations or not even knowing about the government resources, it makes it easy for me to come in and say, hey, what can we do better that my parents never got or that I never got as a business owner? And so this week, we were so honored and thrilled to announce the first ever AI chatbot that's going to help small businesses in a way that uh, no other city in the country is even daring to do. The mayor announced responsible AI government use. And this rollout that we did on Monday is actually a prime example of it. Because number one, people are worried with AI that it's going to take away people's jobs. They're worried with AI that it's going to give you fake news. 
right? These are concerns that people have. But at the same time, the way we've rolled it out, it addresses each one of those concerns. This AI chatbot on the My City business site is a game changer for small business owners who currently, if they want to open up a restaurant, for example, they have to jump from website to website to agency site to site and look for the information they need and have to go one by one. It takes them forever and they get frustrated. Now you have this AI chatbot, you type in, how do I open a restaurant in New York City? And instantly, all in one place, it gives you the links, the resources, the information, boom. Now you're actually like you're talking to a commissioner. You get that information. Uh, the, it, we live in a city that never sleeps, so it's available 24 seven. You won't be put on hold ever, right? It just happens, but it's also done in a way that it, it, it only garners the information within the 2000 business page sites that we have inside the city. It doesn't pull from outside, so you know where the source of the information is coming from. Secondly, it doesn't connect to your My City account, so there's privacy built in. And then after 30 days, all the questions are deleted. It's only kept around for 30 days to improve the AI function of it. So we've, we've really been the leader in AI use for government in the entire country, and that's going to really help small businesses. Every this single is day. where the crowd uh, breaks out in applause right now. <laughs> OK, all right. <laughs> I was going to say, it only took 35 minutes for us to get to artificial intelligence, so that's a, that's a new record. Um, I do know we have an audience question, so I want to make sure we get to it. And uh, you can introduce yourself. Tell us where, where you work as well. Uh, Anthony Campbell. I actually work right here. <laughs> Anthony, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome to our studio. Um, I got another softball for Bruce, because we've been easy on him the whole time. Um, oh, but Bruce. you did reference the Penn District, and I'm discussed and triggered by my Nick fandom. Uh, however, that aside, I, there's all this conversation of where does the garden go? And I feel like that's one, you know, this is an example of the city and where it's going. You have a major transportation hub, you have tons of retail business, you have a big decision that could impact a lot of factors with the city. So I guess one question is, is this as serious as I'm laying out? And two, like, where do you guys think this goes? Well, I, I clearly don't know where it goes at this point, but look, the challenge of building around the garden, I think, has been handled to some degree in the sense that you are looking at one of the great examples of the public-private partnership between the developer there, Ornado, and the state, and what's planned for the whole corridor, I think, is going to significantly improve um, the district, but also improve Penn Station, which we know has to be done. So. You know, to the extent that this is underway, I'm highly, you're talking about billions of dollars that are going to be invested in a neighborhood. That neighborhood is going to transform the city and the area around it and the community around it. So, you know, where should Garden go? I'm not at this point astute enough in terms of or knowledgeable enough about all the details to say they have an extension for where they are. This will play out over time, but you can renovate Penn Station. Under the current circumstances, it will be renovated. And at the end of the day, um, I'm pretty optimistic about the area as a whole. As to the details, that's got to play out. Jeff, this is your wheelhouse, sports and entertainment. So a lot of your clients are in sports entertainment. I alluded before um, to the late night talk shows. Tell us how, I mean, we saw this writer's strike that is now over, the actor's still on strike. Uh, how that, how has that affected New York's economy? Overall, so maybe you can elaborate on that and the ripple effect that, that it has had on New York City. Well, I, I hope this doesn't sound like a rerun for some of the folks who heard our, our earlier conversation. But one of the best things that government does is there's a little bit of a subsidy for local production work. Um, and this impacts the television shows, uh, theaters, Broadway, filming that happens here. And as we discussed, a lot of folks don't understand the ripple effect of how many jobs happen when the talk shows go on strike, when filming doesn't happen here. Um, I had chauffeurs who, they're in, you know, it's not just the grips who lost their job who weren't on strike, who are in a different union that wasn't striking. Uh, it's not just that actors aren't coming to town and then, you know, doing other things, going to movies, uh, taking in, uh, going to restaurants, and so on and so forth. But then, they go out and people, you know, my chauffeurs made less money. They had less money to spend on going out to dinner. 
the multiplier effect of the money as it goes through the economy, uh, I think a lot of folks don't understand how important the production community is to the economy of New York because those dollars get spent over and over and over again after they get brought into town. Uh, we would like to see the writer's strike, I'm sorry, the actor's strike end as well, because while the talk shows are back up, they have a specific waiver, one of the things we're missing out on is film premieres. Now, that may seem like a very frivolous thing, but... Taylor Swift's film did pretty well. <laughs> yes, but... Uh, are you having a Taylor Swift effect the last couple... Well, no, but there are a lot of films that are coming out that you're not seeing any promotion for. Right. Uh, when a... When a Production when a film studio like 20th Century Fox, or uh, well, they're now part of Disney or Sony Pictures or Universal, um, when they're doing a premiere, they can spend close to a quarter million dollars. They fly people into town. That's money for the airlines. They've got to put them up at hotels. They've got to feed them while they're here. They've got to drive them around. Thank you very much. And then they all they do other projects. So that's work for the people at the theater. That's work for the people in the restaurants. And it's hundreds of thousands of dollars on any given project. So losing out on that costs the city quite a bit of money. Rob, uh, we did try to invite Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey, but they were too busy, you told me, before the show. That's why I showed up this morning. <laughs> <laughs> he is pinch hitting for, for yeah. T-Swift. Uh, we do have a Swifty in the audience. No, I'm kidding. We do have an audience. I think we have uh, a Swifty on stage. Are those your uh, friendship bracelets there? <laughs> there it is. Very perceptive. Uh, it, tell us your name and, uh, and where you work. Uh, Dan Delahanty with Dime Community Bank. Welcome. So, gentlemen, speak a little bit about the future, um, maybe five or ten years out. What sectors are you excited about and uh, maybe what sectors are you potentially concerned about and that, that need some attention? It, I think one of the changes you're going to see, and, and this may be part of congestion pricing, and we talked about mixed use on a micro basis in a building, for instance. I think what you're going to start to see is some of the, uh, some of the purveyors of different goods and services that are focused on Manhattan. When people are more reluctant to come into Manhattan, I think you might start to see some of the luxury brands and restaurants and other types of things that you generally associate with Manhattan, uh, theater and uh, art, you know, performing arts you may start to see them pop up in the Bronx and in Queens. That, that's As, a good thing, though. I'm, I'm okay with the Bronx. No, no, no I, I, yeah. I'm okay. That, that may be. I don't think people are looking at it that way. But, uh, you know, communities tend to adapt. Yeah. And I think what's going to happen is it's going to be bad for Manhattan because fewer people will come into Manhattan, and the business community will evolve, and they'll start to respond to it, and you'll start to see some of the things that are usually associated with being in Manhattan, you're going to start to see them popping up in the outer boroughs. Maybe. I had to get my Bronx plug in. <laughs> I know. You were like the mayor of the Bronx, you know, just that borough. <laughs> Kevin, you want to add? Well, as I'm sure Dime is a five borough bank and New York City is a five borough uh, city. We see the different trends that are happening out there. And the one area I'm not worried about is the restaurant industry, right? Because uh, one of the things that when Rob was a former well, business service commissioner and what I love to do about my job is to walk the commercial quarters. And even in January 2022, when I started in this role, we'd be out and about, and mostly out in the Bronx, Staten Island, Queens, Brooklyn areas. And we would see people who opened up restaurants right during the pandemic. And you kind of sit there and you're like, who does that? But actually, it's the immigrants that are coming here um, over almost half of all small businesses are owned by immigrants, and they have no choice. They're not gonna come to this country and find a corporate job. They're not gonna be able to feed their kids in any other way, but to open up a business and find a way to make money. And so when you walk around and we see, when we, we hear that 190 languages are being spoken on any given day in New York City, you see that represented in the food and the, and the culture that's being shared. And it's incredible. And I think that's what really makes New York City such a special place. And that's why tourists keep coming in. So that's one industry I'm not worried about. I think the big emphasis on uh, what Economic Development Corporation, our sister agency, EDC, is working on is making uh, New York City the life science capital of the world, the gaming, and I don't mean by casino gambling, but the video gaming, uh, VR, industries and then also obviously the solar and wind and all the alternative energies and EV uh, kind of uh, 
technology that's all coming about, they're focused on that. So I think anything related to those businesses will do very well in the next five to 10 years. Online gaming revenue now uh, is larger than uh, film, theater, and television production. You know, all the money that is uh, spent in Hollywood on films and movies and uh, DVRs, those be it streaming, is outweighed by the money spent on uh, video gaming, online gaming. So that is a huge new source of revenue. I think I just need to say one thing to put it in perspective because it's been said so well. When you're looking, and we hear so much about this area's hot, Miami's hot, the next city's hot. <clears throat> Let me just make a couple of points. When you're looking to scale a business, in the tech sector, the financial service sector, the service sector, period. There's only one city you really have the infrastructure to do it in, in the country, New York. Education, when it comes to the pool of talent that's available, New York City far outpaces the rest of the country. When it comes to infrastructure, we are investing in our infrastructure in a way in which very few cities can, have, or will. And that's also partly because of the public-private approach that this mayor is looking to take. Last, when it comes at the end of the day to how this city is faring, I'm not concerned. We are building the kind of product that future generations, the Gen Zers, the millennials want. That product was necessary, it's being built. It is what's seen the most success at this point in time, and in this bifurcation of the market, we'll continue to see success. We're tracking properly. We do have to do something about affordable housing to keep the workforce of the future here, and that's something that this mayor has now said is a high priority. So I'm not concerned about the future. I'm very optimistic about the future. At the end of the day, our community is doing better, by and large. And as someone who co-chairs the Intrepid Museum, when the commissioner said that tourism is back, I can tell you we see it every day. I think the peak was 65 or 67 million, so if we end up at 63 million, that's a pretty good number this year. It takes time. We're still recovering from COVID. We're still dealing with the hybrid workplace. We're still dealing with business on pause because of all of the macroeconomic issues that we're facing. So, but business that goes on pause, we also know has pent up demand, will, will express itself in the coming 12 to 18 months. A positive note and feels good. Um, the positives of the pandemic. One thing that I hear in the conversation I've had with Commissioner Kim is our neighborhood strength. Neighborhood strength, and because people return to their neighborhoods, they lived in their neighborhoods for a while. Uh, we saw it uh, being repopulated by restaurants. Can you comment on that? And I and I and I think about new developments that uh, are now on the landscape. I think of the Domino Sugar development that, that just, just opened up. Uh, can we talk more about not just Manhattan, yeah. but, but the this, this strengthening of the 300 plus neighborhoods that make up our great city? Yeah, look, um, if there's a positive takeaway from the pandemic, as you said, it's we, we knew this, but we now know how resilient New Yorkers uh, are. Um, we know that, and we knew that post 9-11, but, but certainly post the pandemic, we, we saw a whole different level of resiliency, and we saw neighborhoods come together uh, in ways in which perhaps we'd never seen before. Um, the Domino Sugar Factory is a great example of how you take an existing older product and with creativity, and great architecture, design a building within a building almost, that will make it attractive to any number of service companies. The neighborhoods, whether it's Long Island City or Brooklyn or the Bronx, we need these neighborhoods as offsets to and alternatives to the cost of doing business in New York. That's what businesses go there for. A, great location, great asset, great infrastructure, but also there's a cost attractiveness to it. So we need developers like those that have the foresight to convert older assets like that into something new and exciting. And I'm very optimistic about 
the future there, as I am about other neighborhoods like Long Island City and Brooklyn. They will continue to flourish in this moment in time as demand returns. Let's just remember, from an office perspective, demand is slowing, is, is, it's slowed down at this point in time, but we know, as I said before, to be terribly redundant, it will return. Before we close things out, um, just briefly want to ask you about uh, growth opportunities. For those business owners watching, where are those opportunities in the five boroughs? Quick thoughts that come to your mind. We'll scan the room. Jeff, first. Well, uh, it's hard because I take a somewhat parochial view. Um, forgive me. I, you know, I, I, I'm thrilled that this mayor is much more pro-business. He copped one of my lines, and I couldn't be prouder. He said, we have to stop uh, bashing the guy in the back seat of the limo because he's making the job for the guy in the front seat of the limo. I, I think that, I'm, I'm sorry, but growth opportunities are difficult right now. I think that there are too many in government, and by that I mean people like the city council and the state assembly and senate, and yes, in the regulatory community, that look at businesses as a pincushion and an ATM. It starts at the top, but it's the inertia at the, in the trenches at the, forgive me, the bureaucracies. You know, their job is to regulate, and therefore they feel that the more regulating they do, the better the job that they are doing. Um, there is a congressperson who wants to start taxing people making $125,000 at the same level as people making half a million dollars. That is chasing people out. I think the opportunity is to change the mindset of people in the regulatory community and in legislature to understand that business is the golden goose. And just as there are people in business who do wrong, there are people in any field who do wrong, but we can't condemn the entire community. And I think that the opportunity is to change the mindset because for the government, you know, at the large level, like the Vornado uh, Penn Station area. But at the small business level, there really aren't tremendous advocates outside people like Commissioner Kim. And the folks in the trenches at the bureaucracies, I think the opportunity is to change the mindset, to look at business as a good thing, rather than all businesses are exploiting their workers and ripping off their customers. And to be fair, there's a very pro-small business environment during COVID that may have switched a little bit, maybe bounced back. Kevin, what, did, what do you see as far as that? I think, as Jeff pointed out, it is important to have all of this start from the top. And when Mayor Adams says we are going to be and we are now the city of yes for small businesses, he means it. And all the things I've brought up, the data is backing it up. Um, you know, but it's it's it doesn't really matter where the growth opportunities are going to come from from our perspective because wherever it does, we need to be there to support those businesses taking advantage of it. And I think. Uh, when I talk about the AI chatbot so that now they can just access the resources faster, when I talk about, again, another first in the country uh, technology use, we just launched the NYC Funds Finder. This is something where anybody can just go on and look for loans and grant programs that not just the city has, but city, state, federal. You can access it all in one site. So wherever those growth opportunities are, we need to be there for them whether it's online, whether it's through our seven business solution centers that are scattered around the city. And then I know Stu mentioned about finding work for people out in Long Island and some of the challenges there. Our agency, as small as it is, we also run the 18 workforce centers around the city. And there, we are just a matchmaking service. We will match employers to New Yorkers who just want good jobs. And so, that's something where through, through your network of businesses, please connect them to our workforce centers and we will find them the employment that they need. The migrant crisis that's going on right now, actually after this, I'm headed to the legal clinic where the, uh, the asylum seekers are coming to get their work permit uh, applications uh, filled out. And you know, as soon as they're work permitted, we have a plan to get them connected to jobs. And so the business community is such a critical partner to this. Because you need to let us know, you need to let our workforce centers know that you want to hire, that you need to hire, and then we will have them trained and ready to serve. The biggest opportunities you generally don't see coming. 50 years ago, nobody thought computers or the internet, nobody even knew they existed. And 
you know, look at how they contribute to our economy. And, you know, that's what I think sometimes regulators don't understand, is that you just have to give people an opportunity to throw the spaghetti against the wall. They will come up, you know, Steve Jobs, without him, who knows where we would be, and people like Bill Gates. It's hard to predict where the next opportunity is coming from. There has to be a little bit of creative chaos, and you have to allow that to happen. And speaking for Joe Connolly, myself, I know Rob feels the same way. I mean, that's why we love covering business, because you never know the ingenuity that's going to come out of the innovation. That's why I love covering that business. Um, before we wrap things up, final thoughts. Leave us on a positive note. First, look, I, I end where I began. I am extremely optimistic about the future of this city. Um, we are seeing positive signs everywhere. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the market is not dead. The market is bifurcating, and we are seeing assets perform. People are returning to work. Um, and I remind us, it's, it, if we're at 50%, the benchmark was 70 or 75, but we're over 50% and growing. The thing I really want to sort of leave people with is young people in today's work, if you will, atmosphere, want mentorship. They're craving for mentorship, and they want socialization. So they're coming back to work. As to New York City itself, we are outperforming against other major gateway cities. We should remind ourselves of that. The cautionary note is that there's a premium to do business in New York, and Jeff alluded to this. And at the end of the day, we have to be careful. We have to know what that sort of line and sand is and make sure we're on the other side of it. By and large, I think we're doing well. And as Commissioner Kim has said, the focus on small business, on supporting small business, that's the engine. At the end of the day, big business matters significantly, but small business is the engine behind our city, and I think we're doing very well on that. And the mayor has his eye on the ball. That's great. You know, to quote the great philosopher Mark Bizumski, <laughs> <laughs> The best I've is read yet. a lot of his work. <laughs> <laughs> the best is yet to come. There you go. Many emails like that. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. Rob Walsh, thank you for being my co-host today from 1010 Wins. Appreciate that. Bruce Mosler, Cushman, and Wakefield, thank you. Commissioner Kevin Kim from Small Business Services and Jeff Rose, Attitude New York. Um, I want to thank Dime Community Bank for your partnership over the last six years at WCBS 880. Um, they've become great friends or team over there, and we're very appreciative of all they do supporting our business programming at WCBS. Again, you can watch our Small Business Spotlight series every Monday, wcbs880.com slash spotlight, and that is also sponsored by Dime Community Bank, our good friends there. You can visit them at dime.com. For Joe Connolly and our entire team at WCBS 880, I'm Neil A. Caruso. We'll talk to you soon.